Good, happy Sunday. And it's a special Sunday. It's actually Happy Youth Sunday this morning. So you might see some, some new faces on stage today helping us in worship. And we've got youth serving behind the scenes too. So we're thankful to have, have youth willing to plug in and serve this morning. Um, we're going to kick it off with the song, This is Amazing Grace. So will you stand and, and join us as we celebrate his grace?
You may be seated. Hey, good morning, church. Happy Sunday. It's good to see all of you. Hey, if you're visiting with us this morning, just a quick introduction. My name is Joel, and it's uh, my privilege to serve as one of the pastors here on the ministry team and to be bringing God's Word to you this morning. So I want to encourage you to turn, if you have your Bibles with you, maybe you follow on your phone, to Colossians chapter 1 as we look at verses 9 through 14 this morning in Colossians chapter 1. And I just want to read for you You'll see it on the screen. Look at what it says right at the beginning of Colossians chapter 1. The first half of the verse says this. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. Now, why? Understand what's going on, the whole context behind why Colossians was written. Why are they praying for them? Go back to last week. Remember who Epaphras was? Epaphras was someone who came to be a believer under Paul's ministry, went back home to Colossae, planted a church, was most likely its pastor, and he comes back to Paul while Paul is in prison in Rome, and he gives Paul two things. He reminds him of two things. He says, this church in Colossae, it tells us this earlier in the verses, 
They have a deep faith in Christ. In fact, if you remember last week, what we talked about was this. They leaned their whole weight on Christ. Remember talking about that? And so he said they leaned their whole weight on Christ. So last week, the whole focus of the text in verses 3 through 5, as Paul writes this letter, was this. Hey, I am thankful for you because we've got such a good report on your hearts and that you were seeking to lean everything into Christ, all your faith. Now this week, as it goes to verse 9, he transitions and he says this, we have not stopped praying for you. Understand why he didn't stop praying for him. Because Epaphras also brought another message, and the message was this, we need to warn them as well. Because there are false teachers teaching a false gospel who are trying to weave their way into the church at Colossae. Remember, one of the biggest threats to the church is not necessarily the sin that's in our face that we see. We know that's a threat. The biggest threats are the things we don't see. It's the half-truths about God's Word that aren't necessarily true that drag us away and pull us away. And so Paul today says, hey, I want you to know something. I am praying for you ever since I first heard about you. Why? See, his prayer is centered around this. He's praying that they will guard their hearts and that they won't fall away. Proverbs 4.23, remember what it says in Proverbs 4.23. It says this, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. In other words, when you read a verse like that, understand this, what controls your thoughts is going to control your behavior. And so Paul understands two things as he writes to the church in Colossae. And the first thing he understands is this, how unpredictable our hearts are. How fickle our hearts are. Did you ever notice how unpredictable your heart is? How you can go one minute praising God? Just write down James chapter 3 where it says this, man, one second I can be praising God with my lips and in the very next second... I can be cursing man. Have you ever experienced that? I'll answer for you. Yes, we have. Psalm 139. You want an illustration? Just read Psalm 139, where he literally goes in from one sentence to the next, God, you are the greatest. But will you do me a favor? Kill all my enemies, he says. See, so Paul understands something. We can be totally focused on Jesus Christ, and in the very next minute, be pulled away and drug away. And so he says, I'm going to pray for you to guard your heart. So he recognizes how fickle our hearts are. Second thing he recognizes is this. He recognizes who Satan was. Remember how subtle Satan is. He will not always tempt you with sin. Sometimes he will tempt you with a half-truth to pull you away from the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Peter 5, verse 8, just for a picture of what Satan is like. The first two words Peter says in verse 8 is this, stay alert. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And so Paul says, I'm praying for you. And understand this, there's five things that Paul prays for, for the church at Colossae, and recognize something. Paul's prayer, because Paul recognizes, these are five things that are necessary for you and I, okay? Five things we need in our hearts and in our minds in order to guard our hearts and to not be led away and drug away. And so I really want to answer two questions with this text this morning because the text really answers two questions. And the first one is this. What do we need? These five things that Paul prays for, what do we need in order to guard our hearts? And then how do we get them? And so as we look to God's word, we take a minute and pray with me. God, you are good. <laughs> and God, you are great. God, you are holy and you are just and you are right, and you are all glorious and all powerful. And so God, you are the reason we're here. God, if we came in here for any other reason, will you turn our hearts towards you now? 
with whatever those distractions are. God, we want to hear the truth of your word this morning, so we pray, Lord, that you simply take those distractions away from us that could pull us away from the truth of your word. God, focus our hearts on the truth you have this morning from your word. God, soften our hearts to the truth of your word. God, in this morning, teach us, Lord, and train us. God, correct us and rebuke us. Those are the things we need to hear. So we pray this in your son's name and all of God's people said together. Amen. So read with me. So what I want to do again is look at these five things that Paul prays for because it gives us a picture in the things that should exist in our hearts and in our minds. So start with me in verse 9. And it says this in verse 9. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you, one, complete knowledge of his will, and to give you, two, spiritual wisdom, and three, understanding. Now, what is he talking about? Understand, I just want to break these three down for you a minute so that we understand what Paul is praying for and why they're important. Because remember, what Paul is saying is, you need these things. If you're going to guard your heart, and you're not going to be pulled away or led away, and you're going to be rock solid in your faith, these are things that have to exist. So what's he talking about when he says knowledge of his will? Just understand this. What he's praying for is this. Here's my prayer, he says, that you have a deep, intimate relationship with God, and as a result, you are fully aware, and you fully understand what he wants and where he's leading you. So Paul says, you want to guard your heart? First thing I'm going to pray for you is this, intimacy with God. So that you understand who he is, that you understand who you are, you understand what he wants, and you understand where he's leading you, what his will is, knowledge of his will. And then he says this, I'm also praying for this, that you'll have spiritual wisdom. Understand what those words mean. When Paul says, I'm praying that you have spiritual wisdom, here's what he's saying. I simply pray that you understand the truth of God's word that you know what the truth is, that you know it and you understand it. That's what I'm praying for. That's what he's saying there. And then he says this, but I'm also praying that you have spiritual understanding. Understand what that means for us. So first, it's intimacy with him, understanding as well. Second, I know the truth of God's word. Third, spiritual understanding. Here's what it means, that you can take it and now you live it. You apply it to your life. And in Jewish culture, and this really isn't any different for us, in Jewish culture, it was not considered you knew what truth was until people saw you living it out. So that's what he's saying. So to summarize, here's what he's really saying. Here's what I want you to to know. Here's what I'm praying for for you so that you guard your heart and you're not led away. Let me summarize it this way. To know what absolute truth is, he says, and to live it out. That's what I pray for, especially... In the areas of morality, recognize this this morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. You want to guard your heart? It is crucial, crucial that first and foremost, we know the truth of God's word. Write this down. It's on the screen. Recognize this. You call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ here this morning, okay? If that's who you are, this is one of our great responsibilities, A, to know God, an intimate relationship with him, and what he requires of us. That is our first responsibility, to know who he is and to what he wants. So if you call yourself a follower and you say, I'm going to guard my heart, It's crucial. And recognize the warning here too, okay? We can't claim ignorance. We can't pretend we don't know. We can't pretend we haven't read it because he's given it to us. Again, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we can't claim ignorance. We have truth. We know truth. And he's saying, intimacy with God so you know his will. Know the truth of God's word and then live it out. 
So the first three things of how we guard our heart. And it's why Paul talks about it so much. I want to give you some verses, because here's what Paul understood. Here's why Paul talks about it. He talks about it in Isaiah. He doesn't talk about it in Isaiah. He wasn't alive when Isaiah was written. But let me give you some verses first that are before Paul. Isaiah 5.13. Hosea 4.6, talking about how important it is to know the truth and to live it out. Ephesians 4, 13 and 14, 1 Corinthians 1, 5, Paul starts in 1 Corinthians saying this. He starts in Ephesians 1, 17 saying this. He starts in Philippians 1, 9 saying this. He starts in Colossians 1, 9 saying this. He starts in Colossians 2, 3, and in Colossians 3, 10, Paul knew it was important, and it's why he talks about it so much. Because see, here's the risk. You want to understand the risk? Here's the risk. If we don't know the truth, first and foremost as believers, if we don't know it, and if we don't apply it, now we're going to allow culture and everything around culture to interpret God's word for us because we don't know the truth ourselves. Don't ever, as you study God's word and as you interpret God's word, here's where we get it backwards and we stop guarding our hearts. We begin to look at what's happening in culture and that becomes the lens that we now interpret scripture. And we see things happening in culture and we don't understand the truth of what God's word is saying. This is a huge issue. I'm just going to give you one area right now, one example of this, okay? In the area of sexual identity in our culture, does it seem like things have gone off the rails? Yes? You want to know the risk? When we don't know God's word, And we don't study the truth of God's word and what it says. And we now begin to look at culture and we say things like, well, that relationship seems okay. They seem happy and well-adjusted and fine. They seem okay over there, even though it doesn't match up. And then we begin to say, oh, that must be what God's word really means. Instead of reading God's word, knowing the truth, and now that's the lens we look at culture. Because what we should be saying is, no, that all goes against God's design, and it goes against God's plan, and it goes against God's law. And if we live in a place of unrepentance in those areas in our lives, our response should be, it may look okay, but those are lost souls who don't know Jesus. Recognize this. We can easily look at culture, okay, and say, man, where in the world is culture going? It's not culture's fault. Culture's always going to go the opposite of what God's Word teaches. Always, always, always. When it keeps drifting further and further that way, it's our fault. Because we've stopped standing for truth. And we've stopped warning in love. And we've stopped pointing people to the truth. See, that's the risk. And that's why Paul says, here's what I'm going to pray for for you. That you know God and you understand his will for you, and that you understand the truth of God's word, and you live it out. I want to look at verse 11, because there's two more. You see, as we talk about interacting with culture, verse 11, Paul says, I'm going to pray for two more things for you. And both of these things that he prays for in verse 11 have everything to do with how we interact with culture. See, the first three are how we interact with God and his word. But then Paul says, I'm also going to pray for this for you. Because this is important for remembering for how we interact with culture and how we guard our hearts. Look at what he says in verse 11. We also pray 
that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power. Circle glorious power. So you will have all the endurance and patience you may need. May you, he says, be filled with joy. So recognize what he's saying. Now he's saying, okay, so how are we going to interact with culture? He gives us two words. He said, here's what I'm praying for for you as you interact with culture. And he says, I'm going to pray that by God's strength, he gives you endurance. Understand what endurance means. Endurance means this, to hold one's position in battle. I'm going to stand firm. And I'm not going to allow all the stuff going on around me to pull me away. And it's a reminder that we're in a spiritual battle. Remember what it says in Ephesians chapter 6. We don't fight flesh and blood. We're in a spiritual battle. And so Paul says, I'm going to pray that you have endurance. And then recognize the second word. He says, I'm also going to pray that you have patience. And it literally means this, long-suffering with others. Anybody else like the word long-suffering? It means long-suffering. And when he talks about patience, he's talking specifically for you and I. Here's what he's saying. I want you to be patient with people. Stop being impatient with culture. Stop being impatient with people. He's saying this, to bear with people in their unpleasantness and their maliciousness. That's what he's saying. I'm going to pray for that for you as believers. I have a question for you. As you look around culture today, does it appear we've become somewhat unpleasant and malicious? Paul says, I'm going to pray that you have endurance. And here's why Paul prays to say endurance and patience. Because here's what Paul recognizes. He recognizes this, that sometimes for you and I, it's easier to give in. He recognizes sometimes for you and I, it's easier to be won over by culture's arguments and to say things like, you know what, you're right. This is no big deal. How often have we said, I've said it, maybe you've said it too. We know truth and we see disobedience going on. And for most of us, it's very close and it's very intimate and it's very personal. It's family whatever. And we say things like, I don't want to lose the relationship. I don't want to say anything because it might cost me the relationship. Paul is saying, I'm going to pray that you have endurance and that you have patience and that you recognize the souls that are at stake and so we don't give in. See, recognizing what giving in does, when we give in, and we are okay with things that go against God's design, we now damage our relationship with God. And we mar the image of God to those around us. And that's the biggest tragedy. So Paul says, I'm going to pray for these things. I'm going to pray that you have knowledge of the will of God. I'm going to pray that you have wisdom. I'm going to pray that you have understanding. I'm going to pray that you have patience and that you have endurance. So in the final few minutes together, just want to talk about how do we obtain those things? How do we obtain knowledge and wisdom and understanding and endurance and patience? First way is this. You need first and foremost to desire it. It has to be something you desire. It will not happen unnaturally. It has to be a choice you make. Let me ask you a question. What are some of the things you desire most in your life right now? How about, for some of you, maybe you desire to get married. Notice how I looked at the central crowd. I'm sorry. That was unintentional completely. Sometimes your desire is to get married. Or maybe to have a family. I'm not looking at anyone right now. Or maybe to advance your career, or maybe to make more money, or to have more authority, and to have more status. I want you to write down Job 28, and I want you to write down Proverbs chapter 9, verses 1 through 11, and ask yourself, what do I desire? And be reminded from both of those passages that God's word reminds us 
but our greatest desire. After a relationship with him, is for wisdom and for understanding. And so ask yourself this question. Start there. If I'm going to have a heart that's guarded and I'm not going to be drug away, first of all, do I desire wisdom? And to answer that question, simply ask yourself this question. When I face difficulty, when I face uncertainty, when I face struggles, where do I turn first? Do I turn to myself? Or do I open the word of God? Where he's given us all truth. So you have to desire it. Second, I changed the wording on this, and then they changed it on the screen on me, so now i got to remember what it says. I first just wrote, depend on the Spirit. But actually what I wanted to write was this after I thought about it more. Depending wholly and completely on submitting to the Spirit of God. You want to have knowledge and wisdom and understanding and endurance and patience. You need to remember first and foremost, you can't do it on your own. There's no chance. And if you're going to have those things, you are going to depend wholly and completely on the Spirit of God. Look at verses 9 and look at verses 11. I want you to see a word that Paul uses in these. Go back to verse 9. He says, so we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. He says, we ask God, A, to give, circle the word give, give you complete knowledge of his will, and then it says it again, and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now go to verse 11, and he says, we also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power. Circle that word strengthened, so that you will have endurance and patience that you will have all the endurance and patience that you need. See those words, strengthened? See that word give? Maybe you have the word filled in your Bible. I want you to understand what those two words mean. Remember what we're talking about. If you're going to have knowledge and wisdom and understanding and endurance and patience, you're going to rely wholly on God's word. And what Paul is saying when he uses the word filled and he uses the word strengthened, they have the exact same meaning, and they mean this, to be completely under the control of something. To be completely under the control and in this case, what Paul is saying is this, to be completely under the control of the Spirit. In fact, if you were to rewrite this verse to include all those words, Paul would have said, my prayer is that you are completely under the control of the Spirit. Why? So as a result, you possess his knowledge, his wisdom, his understanding, his endurance, and his patience. So how do you gain these things, and how do you obtain these things? You recognize I want you to see verse 10. Then look what Paul says after all that. He says this, then. Circle the word then. Then, he says. In other words, when you've done these things, when you've submitted, when you are under the control of these things, then, he says, the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce, circle that, every kind of good fruit. So understand that. That's what's going to be a result. Don't forget, every single one of us out here, we are all fruit producers. Do you realize that? The question is, am I producing good fruit? Or am I producing destructive fruit? We are all fruit producers. So I want you to evaluate something this week as you think about, am I completely under the control of God's Spirit? Evaluate this. When you evaluate, man, am I living a life with knowledge and wisdom and understanding and endurance and patience? Evaluate from this perspective. Evaluate what kind of fruit am I producing? What am I producing? And as you evaluate that, do it with two scripture passages. First one is Galatians 5. Write down Galatians 5, verses 16 through 23. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 23, verse 16 says this, let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Is that the best advice we could receive as believers? It's that simple. Let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Stop trying to do it on your own. And then when you get to verses 17 through 23, it's this comparison and this dichotomy. And in verses 17 through 19, Paul says this, if you don't let the Holy Spirit guide your life, this is the life you'll live. And it's all kinds of destructive behaviors of the flesh, just junk that we don't want to deal with. 
And then he gets to verses 22 and 23, the verses we know, and he says, but when you decide to live a spirit-filled under the control of the spirit, then this is the life you'll live. And so evaluate that this week and ask yourself, is this who I am? And by the fruit I'm producing, what does it say about the life I'm living? And we're all going to recognize that there are those destructive behaviors going on in verses 17 through 19 that exist and they need to go. And so confess it and repent of it. And as you do, read what Paul says about Jesus and about who God is in verses 12 through 14 to be reminded of his grace and his mercy to you. And then be done with it and repent of it. Listen to what he says. Always thankful for the Father. I want you to circle that word, he. If you like to take notes in your Bible, circle that word, he, and even capitalize it in the notes. That's what I've done in my Bible. I've put it, he, it says, and I've capitalized it. But then I wrote this next to it, really small, as tiny as I can get it, in parentheses. It says he, and then it says, not me. Remember that. It's because of what he did not because of what I did. And it says five things. So take heart with these things as you confess and repent. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people. In other words, he initiated it. You didn't. He has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. He transformed us into the kingdom of his dear son. He purchased our freedom. He forgave our sins. And confess it and repent it. And then just let me close with this. We desire it. We submit to his spirit. And then third, and if you haven't figured this one out already, shame on me for not being a very good teacher. We study God's word. You want to know the truth of God's word? You need to take time and discipline and commitment. Look what it says in 2 Peter 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is A, inspired by God. It's useful to teach what is true, to make us realize what is wrong. It corrects us when we are wrong, teaches us to do what is right, uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Just remember this. One last thing. Don't just read God's word. Don't read it. Don't say I've read it, so I've done what I need to do. Study God's word. And as you study God's word, pray for understanding. You know, I mentioned this a couple months ago, just something super practical. If you're somebody who doesn't study God's word and you're realizing it this morning, it's like, I need to establish that discipline. Just pick a book of the Bible and for the next 90 days, study one book. Just read through that book. And as you do, take notes on the verses that don't make sense and then come back to those verses and begin to study those verses more in depth to have a clearer understanding of what God's word is saying to you there. And I'm just going to give you a commentary, okay? Commentaries are always good. Don't ignore commentaries. And don't ever open God's word thinking that you are somehow going to find some revelation that no one's ever found before. You're not that smart, and neither am I. It's already there. God's already given to us. It's already been discovered. There's not new revelation for us to find there. It's there for us to read and learn from. So there's a commentary out there online. Let me just recommend it. Just something real practical. It's called the Enduring Word Commentary. It's simple truth. It's easy to understand. It's every verse in the book of the Bible. You can click on that commentary, put the app on your phone, and just begin to read that commentary as you study God's Word and say, I don't get it, but I want to understand it. And then just begin to study God's Word. And then let God give you boldness and courage to know the truth and then to apply the truth so we can guard our hearts as we don't stray away. Will you pray with me? God, we're thankful for your word. Thankful for the truth of your word as you give it to us. God, you're a good God. And so may we never forget, Lord, the good things that you do for us. God, guard our hearts and guard our minds. God, hold us firm. God, give us endurance 
and patience. God, give us an intimacy with you that draws us close to you. God, we want to know you. And we want to clearly understand your plans and your purposes for us so that you can work in us and work through us. So God, turn our hearts towards you. God, cleanse us and redeem us by the blood of your Son and the power of your Spirit. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. Stand and worship.
Hey, I'm going to have you go ahead and be seated. We have one more thing we want to do yet this morning, too, before we leave, and just want to take some time to uh, celebrate and uh, just recognize as well just the work God is doing um, in our youth ministry here. Um, we have so many great leaders, great young people who serve kind of all over this town. They're all over this ministry as well on a Sunday morning, helping in children's ministry, and you see some at the door greeting and just all over the place. And, and this morning, we get to welcome some of them with us on stage as well, just to be a part of worship with us. Um, I just want to take a couple minutes this morning just to kind of get an update and just kind of celebrate what God is doing. And so I want to introduce to you, if you don't know him already, this is Jack Sagan, and we're very thankful for Jack. So Jack came to us as an intern last summer, um, way at the beginning of June, spent the summer with us, that turned into a part-time role with us while he finishes up exercise science at Central University of Iowa. And uh, then this semester, just really thankful as we were in need of someone to lead our youth ministry program and uh, Jep, Jack, Jep, Jack stepped up this semester for us too and stepped into that role as our interim youth pastor. And so uh, welcome you up here as well. And just kind of, you can just give us just a kind of a quick overview of just what God's been doing and, and uh, the work that's going on. We'd love to hear it. Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Jack Sagan. I've been filling as the interim youth pastor here this semester. And just as Joel was wrapping up in his sermon today, he said it um, multiple times, but I... Uh, was reading Hebrews, and that's what I decided to study uh, going into winter break, probably just early December. And as I heard about the role and accepted the interim role, that's what I decided we were going to teach the middle schoolers and high schoolers. So I filtered that in to that as well. So I was studying that. I was also teaching it, which was really great. And so we kind of just focused on the theme, Jesus is better, and had about seven or so talks building on that foundation. And um, had some other fun nights and some leader testimonies, which was great. So um, the semester was great with high schoolers and middle schoolers. And I want to thank my leaders that I had made it go a little bit more fluid than it could have possibly gone by myself. So thankfully, we had some wonderful help. Um, so middle school was Clay Corns and Brooke Schott, Gabby Meninga, and Seth Moeller. And then high school leaders were Brooke Ehrenberg, Brooke Schott again, Kayla Van Wyk, Dawson Ford, and Trevor Budwitz. And so without those leaders, it would not have, uh, would not have been possible. So um, I'm so thankful for them, and I'm so thankful for, yeah, three of them were uh, college seniors as well, and so they're moving out the door, and so we'll need help in the near future next year. And so um, if anybody's uh, willing for that, then we can get you a role in that. But... Um, yeah, so that's how this semester has gone and kind of what we focused on this semester. And then this summer, we're going to be headed to, in early June, I'm sorry, the end of June, with middle schoolers, we'll be going to Fairfield, Iowa for a short service trip. And then middle of July, we'll be going to Waverly, Tennessee with the high schoolers for about a week to help with some cleanup from flooding for last year. And then we also have a camp opportunity in northern Iowa that you could talk to me about or Joel or um, other people on staff about and interest with that. And then we also have new to Federated this year is VBS. And so we'll be doing that from uh, June 12th to June 15th. And we have some signups in the back for that for leaders or sign up your kids uh, three years old to going to sixth grade for that. Um, and so with, with that, uh, it is Youth Sunday, so I'd like to actually welcome up our seniors who are graduating high school. And if they could join me on stage, they're going to give us a little introduction of who they are. And That's your cue. Somebody's got to go headed. first. So yeah, if you guys just line up on stage, you can do over here, and we'll go down the line. I'll hand you the mic. So yeah, if you could do your name, where you're graduating from, and what are your plans after. I'm Olivia Corns. I'm graduating from Pella Community High School, and I'm going to Iowa State University next year to major in Human Development and Family Studies. I'm Jonathan Watson, and I go to Knoxville High School, and I'm homeschooled. I'll be swimming for Luther College and majoring in business. I'm Ethan Coel. I'm graduating from Pella High School, and I'm going to Cedarville University to study finance. 
I'm Autumn McMahon. I'm graduating from North Mahaska High School, and I'm going to Central College for a business major and a minor in art. I'm Aiden Brands. I'm graduating from Pella High School, and I will be completing my weld apprenticeship at Vermeer. I'm Anna Ryder. I'm graduating from Pella High School, and I will be continuing to work as an apprentice at Digital Galleria. I'm Charlize DeArmond, graduating from Pella Community and taking a gap year until I figure out what I want to do. Uh, I'm Henry Hick, graduating from Pella, and I'm going to finish my welding apprenticeship at Kalani. My name is Natalie Harrell, and I'm graduating from Pella Christian, and I'm planning to go to Iowa State for international business and minors in French and Spanish. I'm Emma Witzenberg. I'm graduating from Pella Christian, and I am planning on going to the University of Iowa to get my degree in neuropsychology. Cool. Hey, can we just show our congratulations to these guys? <laughs> and again, and again, like, like Jack said, just uh, thankful for you guys and praying for you guys as well. And Jack, thankful for your leadership. As you guys leave the stage, we have a gift for you. So you can go back to the way you came, unless you came from that way. Uh, you can grab this and uh, you're welcome to be seated. Thanks everybody. So I think there's one more group. As these guys um, head back to their seats, there's one more group. I don't know if we talked to you guys about this or not, but how many senior Central students do we have here today with us? If you're a senior Central student, why don't you come up and join us quick a second, please? No lying. We know who you are. Go. Start on that end, maybe. You come in. Cool, yeah, if you guys can just as well, just kind of who you are, um, and just kind of a quick summary of where you're off to. Thanks. Okay, hi, I'm Brooke Schott. Uh, yeah, next. Uh, I'm getting married this July, and then after that, still looking for a job near Ames. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm Krista Larson, uh, and next year I'll be teaching seventh grade social studies in Indianola. I'm Katie Larson, and next year I'll be going to Des Moines University to study physical therapy. I'm Dawson Hensley. I am next year I will be going to Belle Plaine to be an engineer. Hi, I'm Will DeHaan, graduating from Central College with a business degree, and I'll be at Vermeer next year working full time in IT. So you'll see me around here still. I'm Ty England. Uh, majoring in exercise science, and then this summer I'll be working with Nebraska football with their strength and conditioning. Very good. Hey, we congratulate these guys as well. <laughs> Take that. Go ahead. Go ahead. And just, we'll miss all of you. We say this to all of our central students. We're so thankful um, you're a part of this place with us. We don't look at our central students like, oh, they're simply a part of this place. Um, you are this place, and you're with this body, and so we miss you. And uh, we wish you well for the summer as well. We know some of you will be here for a little bit, and some of you will spend the summer with us. So we're excited about that. We continue to pray for you guys as well. And thanks for being a part of Federated as you've settled in here too. So as we close out our service, just to fill you in on one more thing as well. If I had started here, you wouldn't have heard a word we said after this. So we're going to start here. But um, you have been praying with us because we told you Nate left us in December, and we miss him, and we wish him well on where he's at and where God has led him and, and thankful for what God is doing in his life as well. But it left us with a void. And so we were so thankful for Jack stepping into the interim role and doing the summer with us. And as we've been interviewing people and talking to people, it became abundantly clear to us, it's how God works, that he had led us, the person for youth ministry, um, long before we knew we needed one. And so as we looked around and began to pray, we realized the person we needed in our youth ministry, the person God was putting in that place was already under this roof with us. And so in the past week, as we've prayed, we've spent time talking to youth leaders and to parents, and as a staff and elder board, just simply been praying about this, and um, God has led us to offer Jack our youth ministry position here, and as of about 24 hours ago, he uh, graciously accepted, and so he will become our full-time youth pastor, so we're going to welcome him. And he... 
he officially becomes the fastest person on staff. He's automatically jumped to the top of that role, but he's a trackster for Central. And he's also an exercise science major. He's the second one on staff here. So just know that that's a path to ministry. I'm just letting you know over there with our <laughs> exercise science major sitting over there. You don't know it yet, but you're going to be in ministry someday and all those things. But anyway, we welcome you, Jack. We're thankful for you. Some of the things that just stood out, I'm sure things you know as well, um, servant-hearted, humble, um, just wanting to learn and wanting to learn God's Word and, and wanting to learn from the team, and we're learning from Him as well. And so all of those things just jumped out for us as we began to pray about it, continue to interact with Him. And so we are thankful. Uh, it's a blessing for our ministry and just uh, thrilled to have you uh, be a part of this ministry as well. So you will get to know Him better if you don't know him well already, as he'll be around um, full-time starting June 1 with us in that role. So take time to welcome him afterwards. If you have not met him yet, um, take space to say hi to Jack and, and welcome him aboard. So anyway, I'm going to close this in prayer, but I'm going to have you stand for that. Let's take some time. We want to pray for our youth ministry, pray for Jack, and just pray as we leave this place as well. And then after prayer, if you can hold your position. I just want to cover a couple more things with you, and then we'll dismiss. God, we are thankful, first of all, for your sovereignty, for your grace, and for your mercy. God, you lead when we don't even realize you're leading yet. And so we're thankful, Lord, that you led Jack to us, that we've had the opportunity to build a relationship with him and see his heart. And uh, we're thankful, Lord, that he's joining us here as a part of our ministry at Federated. And so we pray, Lord. We pray for him in this moment, Lord. We pray for strength. We pray for endurance. We pray for intimacy with you, Lord. Draw his heart close to you. Deepen his relationship with you. God, give him the things that he needs as he begins to serve you. Build relationships around him and a team of people around him that can support him and encourage him and just give him wisdom and discernment as he leads in the role of leadership that you've called him to here. So God, we just pray for that for him. And God, we're thankful for our youth ministry volunteers, for all of our leaders. What a great group they are. We will miss those who leave us. Um, God, may you plug the gaps Give them strength and energy. God, watch over them and protect them and give them wisdom and discernment as well as they lead and as they mentor and disciple the young people. And just, Lord, watch over, guard, guide, and protect the hearts of all those who are involved. God, we pray for our school systems, our young people in the school systems. God, for people that don't know you, Lord, may you soften their hearts to you by the power of your Spirit. God, we pray for teachers. We pray for faculty. We pray for administration, Lord. We pray for the end. For those who don't know you, Lord, may their hearts turn towards you. God, for those in leadership and in teaching positions that do have a relationship with you, Lord, will you give them wisdom and discernment? Will you give them strength? Will you give them energy and endurance and intimacy with you? God, guide them as they lead, as they are faithful to you. And God, as we leave this place, God, go with us. Give us the things we need, Lord. Keep temptation away. And Lord, in this week, it is simply our prayer, Lord, that you are honored, Lord, that you are glorified, that you are praised, and that you are pleased by what takes place in us and by what takes place through us. We pray all of this in your Son's name and all of God's people said together. Amen. Hold your positions. A couple things I want to highlight really quickly. Back there, it's the last day to grab a baby bottle for the baby bottle campaign with Pella, Pella, or Pathways of Pella. There's a few left. If you're sitting in the front, good luck. But you can probably bowl some people over if you really, really want one. You can get there. There's a few left. There's also the last day to sign up. or I'm sorry, It's the last day to be a part of the fundraiser for our celebration day coming up in a month. There's envelopes back there if you want to support that financially. You can take an envelope. On the sign-up counter that you'll see back there on the Welcome Center, starting... Next Monday night, we have a three, we have a really short Monday series. It's three nights covering The Secret Church by David Platt. It just took place last Friday night. We have a copy of it, and we're going to play the sessions each of the following Monday nights. That way we didn't stay up till midnight Friday night. And we're going to do them each starting at 6.30, starting next Monday night. Again, just talking about our identity is what David Platt talks about. You can see a sign-up sheet back there for that. Love to have you join us. That'll go from about 6.30 to 8, the next three Mondays, starting Monday the 9th. And then there's also, sorry, one more sign-up sheet for Vacation Bible School. You heard Jack talk about it. We're excited to do Vacation Bible School. We need people in two areas. Sign up your kids, K or three-year-old through sixth. And we need volunteers. You'll see both needs back there. So pray about that. Check that out and join. And one last thing, the chairs today stay exactly how they are. Don't touch them, please. We don't stack them today. Thanks. Have a good day.